Thank you, Brooke. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. And hi, everyone. Um, this the topic that I've been asked to talk about of how to develop pest resistant crops is a topic that I've studied for the last 15 years. And um, I'm always, we're always learning more. And at the same time, we're always learn, we're also learning that the stuff that we knew 15 years ago is still as true as it ever was. And so um, I want to offer uh, a very rapid overview and background of how we think about plant immunity to diseases and to insect pests. When I first started down this pathway uh, and I started giving presentations about plant immunity, one of the pieces of feedback that I received from audience members at that early in those early days was that um, we shouldn't be having conversations about plant immunity because that's unfamiliar language and, and unfamiliar lexicon and that it, instead we should be having conversations, we should talking, be talking about disease resistance and insect resistance because the language of resistance is much more familiar. And I found that feedback to be intriguing because in the peer review literature, there are hundreds, actually, no, that's incorrect. There are thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of peer reviewed papers talking about plant immune systems. And yet somewhere there was a gap that that information and that knowledge was not being transferred to either to farmers or to their consultants and agronomists and people who were working in the field. And I found this disconnect to be really intriguing and, and trying to understand why um, we as farmers and why I as a farmer did not have ready access to this information. And of course, we understand we live in a world where uh, economics drives behavior. You achieve what you incentivize. And uh, unfortunately, the economic incentives have not been aligned for most of the stakeholders in the agricultural space to, to really be in a position to have a desire or a motivation to share this information. And so uh, I want to, in this, over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, 40 minutes, I'm going to give you a review of kind of a very high level overview of our perspective on disease and insect resistance and how we think about plant health. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I'm going to frame the conversation in the context of this diagram that we've developed called the plant health pyramid. And um, the question that I'd have for uh, each of you that I'd like to understand as we go through this is how many of you have heard about the plant health pyramid or have some degree of familiarity with it? Because we've put out a lot of information uh, over the last 10 years or so on this topic. Um, we have a webinar on YouTube, we have an in-depth course on the Academy, and we also have an inf infographic on the Plant Health Pyramid that has a lot of the details that I'm going to talk about today that's available on the Advancing Eco Agriculture website, and that I believe is also linked in Whova um, on this event itself that you can find the infographic as well and download that. So, <clears throat> um, oh my goodness, I'm surprised. Um, 92% of you say that you're not familiar with the plant health pyramid. Uh, 49 out of 53 people that have responded. That's, uh, where, where have you guys been? Have you been hiding under a rock or have I been hiding under your rock? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'll give, you, I'll give you an overview of the plant health pyramid, but I would uh, highly suggest that this can be just the starting point. There, is, there are a lot of resources and information available today on how to take this knowledge and actually apply it to the field to produce disease and insect resistance. So the pathway of what brings all this about, um, I could offer a bit more of my personal story, but we have limited time. So I'll just say that when I first founded Advancing Eco Agriculture, it was based on the idea that on uh, the premise that it is possible to manage plant nutrition and plant microbiomes, those two are synergistic, in such a way that we can produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects. And today, 15 years later, um, I can say with complete confidence that it is possible to produce plants that are 100% resistant to all diseases and all insects. And that includes locusts. It includes 
uh, Japanese beetles and corn rootworm beetle and marmorated stink bug. Uh, even the insects that you might think of as being the most invasive, the most pervasive, the most persistent, it's possible to produce complete resistance for simply with nutrition management. And perhaps in that sentence, I shouldn't have used the word simply. It, it, in concept, it is simple. Um, and actually, but uh, it, does, it doesn't happen like flipping a switch overnight. It does take time, particularly for the parts that also require interactions with the microbiome. Regenerating and rebuilding a microbiome is not um, a function that happens in a matter of a few days or even a few weeks in most cases. So thanks for your feedback on the poll. Um, I'll share those results with you really quickly so you can see those. And so now let's dig into the plant health pyramid. Um, we developed this diagram to describe what we observed happening with growers crops. As we started managing plant nutrition differently and started managing microbiomes, we observed this gradual evolution of plant health where plants became resistant to different types of diseases and different types of insects based on what was happening internally within the plant's physiology. And we observed that they became, um, that we could manage these various shifts with nutrition management using foliar applications and so forth quite quickly. So uh, I'll give you a very rapid fire overview and then we're going to go through each of these pieces fairly quickly. Um, I have until, okay, got it, just watching the clock. So the first level of the plant health pyramid is when we have complete photosynthesis. And what we're describing here is plants that um, are no longer producing large quantities of simple sugars that provide a food source that, that you essentially end up with a plant that no longer, that where the plant sap has a high concentration of complex sugars rather than simple sugars. So the BRICS readings will actually go up, but the quantity of simple sugars in plant sap declines, which seems conflicting, but actually isn't. The second level is when plants develop complete proteins. This means that in every 24 hour photo period, all of the nitrogen that they absorb, whether it's in the form of nitrate or ammonium or living bacterial cells, that nitrogen is converted or stored in the form of complete proteins. So again, you now have plant sap that has no longer contains any detectable levels of nitrate or urea or ammonium or any of the ionic forms of nitrogen. And the third level is when we have increased uh, lipid synthesis and we produce plants with a higher fat content. We can observe this visually in the field when we see plants that have a glossy waxy sheen on the leaf surface. And the fourth level is when plants begin producing elevated concentrations, higher concentrations of what we in plain English call essential oils. Um, these, are commonly, these compounds are commonly referred to as plant secondary metabolites. All plants produce these compounds. And at this stage, plants switch from passive immunity to active immunity. And these, many of these compounds have antifungal, antibacterial, and antiviral properties. And uh, they have the capacity to kill, quite frankly. Um, and it is at this stage when plants can really uh, ramp up their resistance levels to a number of different diseases and insects. So, Let's walk through each of these and describe what's happening, what's going on within plants, and take a look at the types of diseases and insects that plants become resistant to at each of these stages. So, level one, complete photosynthesis. What is happening here is that we are getting both a larger quantity of photosynthesis in each 24 hour photo period, and we're getting more complete photosynthesis. So, it is possible. This is one of the foundational pieces. Uh, one of my recent uh, blog posts uh, I titled uh, Photosynthesis is Not a Constant. And this is a foundational flaw in much of the agroecology research that is being done, that is, being look, that is looking at carbon sequestration and so forth. And this is the assumption that photosynthesis happens at a constant rate of speed all the time. And it doesn't. What we have come to consider being as being common or normal is plants that are photosynthesizing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20% of their inherent photosynthetic capacity. 
Now, in an outdoor agricultural environment, it's not reasonable to expect that we're ever going to get to 100%, at least not on a consistent basis. 100% requires that we have perfect sunlight conditions, perfect light conditions, perfect levels of water, perfect temperature, chlorophyll concentrations, and so forth. Everything is required to be ideal. And this ideal state is is sometimes, or I should say frequently produced in a greenhouse environment or in a controlled environment, but very seldom in an outdoor environment. But it is possible to go from 20% up to let's say 50% or 60%. And so when you think about what that means, moving from 20% to 60%, that means you've just tripled the quantity of sugars being produced in every 24 hour photo period. If you can sustain that over the course of the plant's entire life, what does that mean for crop yields? Does that mean you're going to get a plant that's three times as large? Does it mean that you're going to get a yield that's three times as big? Perhaps for some crops, but in many cases, the answer is no. You, you'll not produce three times plant biomass or three times yield because there are other genetic factors that come into play. But it is very realistic to expect that you might get a 20% or a 30% yield increase and you're going to get perhaps 20 or 30% larger plants. So if you think about that discrepancy, you've produced three times more sugars, but you're only producing 30% higher yield. And the question becomes, where does all the extra sugar go? And the answer is all of the surplus sugar gets sent out through the root system as root exudates to feed soil biology. And this is why really healthy plants have the capacity to build soil organic matter and sequester carbon many times faster than unhealthy plants. Plants, uh, the, the degree of, of carbon sequestration is correlated to the degree of overall plant health and photosynthetic capacity. But that's a separate conversation. We wanna move on. Um, the, the second change that occurs at level one of the plant health pyramid is that the carbohydrate profile in the plant sap changes. We now have much more complex carbohydrates. You no longer have simple sugars that are produced from the plants not having a completely functioning enzyme system. And at this stage, <clears throat> so I spoke about the capacity to increase volume. And at this stage, plants now develop resistance to all of the soil-borne fungal pathogens, such as verticillium, and fusarium, rhizoctonia, uh, and also to the umycetes, such as Phytophthora. The reality is uh, we have learned from, uh, I had first learned from Dr. Huber, Don Huber, that these organisms um, change in, in an optimal, let me say it this way, in a disease suppressive soil environment, these potentially pathogenic organisms shift from being uh, pathogens to being saprophytes, meaning to being decomposers. So if you put mulch on a field or in a garden, straw or hay or leaf mulch, um, and it gets rained on a couple of times, you start pulling that mulch apart, you see this white mycelium growing all the way through that. I'm sure many of you have observed that. In many cases, that mycelium is verticillium. And that is verticillium in its beneficial function as a saprophyte, as a decomposer. Um, however, we've learned from James White that there's actually another level. And this I find to be so incredible. Um, when you have plants at this level of health, moving sugars out through the root system and supporting the root microbiome, it changes the microbiome to what is termed a disease suppressive microbiome. And in this environment, in a disease suppressive microbiome, these quote unquote pathogens, I really dislike that word, the word pathogens, because these, these organisms are only pathogenic in the right environment. Uh, but in this healthy environment with a disease suppressive microbiome, these organisms such as Fusarium or Verticillium or Rhizoctonia change and they are no longer pathogens, but they actually develop a beneficial relationship with the plant, a symbiotic relationship with the plant. So verticillium and fusarium will actually uh, penetrate the plant root system just as they would if they were producing an infection, but instead of producing a quote unquote infection and behaving like a pathogen and uh, taking nutrients away from the plant, they actually 
develop this symbiotic relationship where they contribute nutrients to the plant exactly the same as mycorrhizal fungi or other beneficial fungi. So the only difference when in, in these organisms expressing themselves as pathogens or expressing themselves as beneficials is the presence of other disease suppressive organisms in the microbiome and how well those other organisms are supported by the plant as a result of sugars moving down into the root system. So what happens at level one is that these plants develop resistance as a result of a changing microbiome to these soil borne fungal pathogens. And to reach this stage, and I'll just, I'm gonna gloss over this fairly quickly because you can find the information again in the, in the infographic or in the other online resources. But to reach this stage, plants require adequate levels of magnesium, iron, manganese, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to apply each of these five. I'm suggesting you need to make sure that your crop has enough of each of these five. Uh, they may have enough of two or three out of the five, but be missing the rest. And so it's important to address all five of these and make sure that plants have enough. Then we get to level two of the plant health pyramid. Um, and this is an interesting one. Um, at this stage, plants are converting all of the nitrogen that they've absorbed from the soil profile into complete proteins in each 24 hour photo period. Our goal, we use a lot of sap analysis in our consulting work and in our sap analysis, we measure both nitrate levels and ammonium levels present in plant sap. And our goal is to see both nitrate and ammonium at zero, but to have total nitrogen be at abundant levels. And this is a very achievable, realistic goal. We see it on the majority of the crops that we work with very quickly. And <clears throat> the reason for this, uh, I want, I'm going to describe some of the enzyme interactions that occur inside plants and inside uh, insects and digestive systems so that you understand why this is important. So we're going to go down a rabbit hole here a little bit, but the rabbit hole is important, or maybe I could call it an earthworm hole. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we want no soluble nitrogen compounds remaining in plant sap. And what does this process look like? Well, imagine uh, first we start with the building block of glucose that is performed or that is produced during photosynthesis. So glucose, uh, imagine that you have this sh short chain, the, the chemical symbol or a math or model, whatever you wanna call it for uh, glucose is C6H12O6, six links of carbon, 12 links of hydrogen, six links of oxygen. So just visualize this or imagine this as a short chain that has 24 links. This short chain of glucose uh, then gets reconfigured and rearranged and nitrogen is added to it. And the combination of these simple sugars plus um, nitrogen in different combinations are now referred to as amino acids. And there are 23 common amino acids. There's several hundred that have been identified so far, but we all know the 23 main ones that we need to mostly need to concern ourselves with. These 23 common amino acids are now bonded together in pairs of two or three that are now called peptides. You may have heard of dipeptides or tripeptides. These are simply grouped combinations of amino acids. Lastly, those peptides are bonded together to form much longer, more complex chains that we now refer to as complete proteins. And these complete proteins can be very complex compounds. Some of the more complex proteins are found in muscle tissue and they may have as many as 200 to 300,000 links in the chain. So very long, very complex protein compounds. Now, the reason this is worth describing is so that we understand the critical function of trace minerals in forming these compounds. Each time <clears throat> one of these bonds gets built, when nitrogen gets bonded to sugar, or when amino acid A gets bonded to amino acid B, or when peptide X gets bonded to peptide Z, all of these reactions 
require an enzyme as a catalyst. And enzymes are these crystalline proteins that exist within plants. Uh, about 80% of a plant's total nitrogen requirement exists as in the form of enzymes. So this is where the majority of the nitrogen goes in a plant is actually um, to form enzymes. And so then a, a significant proportion of the remainder goes to chlorophyll. So these enzymes look like crystalline proteins. However, in order to function, this is, uh, these are some photomicrographs of actual enzymes um, from inside plants. Isn't that amazing? We have all these unique crystalline forms. Each enzyme is like an end wrench in that it can only perform one specific function. Each enzyme, uh, just like an each end wrench only fits one size nut or bolt properly, each enzyme can only catalyze one specific reaction. It can only catalyze amino acid A versus amino acid B. It cannot catalyze any other amino acid combination or peptides or anything else. So they're single purpose, but like an end wrench, they can perform the same task over and over and over again without being used up. And the reason this is important is because each of these enzymes requires what is called an enzyme cofactor. And these enzyme cofactors are metallic minerals or B vitamins that are dependent on a metallic elements such as vitamin B12, which contains cobalt. So these enzyme cofactors are magnesium and nickel and selenium and molybdenum and silver and tin um, and a long list of elements that are considered to be beneficial to plant life, but not necessarily considered to be uh, crucial according to the regulators from a regulatory perspective. So the key is that um, without the enzyme cofactor, the enzyme is dysfunctional and is incapable of doing its job. So if you have a plant that uh, is missing one of these enzyme cofactors, then whatever bonds that particular enzyme is responsible for producing never get built. And the result is a plant that has uh, either imperfectly formed proteins or imperfectly formed peptides or an overabundance and a high concentration of soluble nitrogen compounds inside the plant sap because these uh, this nitrogen conversion process to complete proteins happens very slowly, very poorly, or not at all. And the reason this is important is because of how it relates to insect digestion as compared to human or, or animal digestion. So there's this quote from William Albrecht that I think is nails this so accurately, and we would do well to understand what is behind it, so that insects are nature's garbage collectors and diseases are her cleanup crew. And this is so accurate. Insects and diseases only attack unhealthy plants. And the reality is that on some level, we all know this. We all know this to be true. We all know that uh, if we have a field of a crop, the any disease or any insect will begin manifesting in a certain small area of that field first. And it will always be the area that is stressed. Perhaps it's a low spot and had standing water, whatever the reason was, um, there's a reason why they begin at a certain part of the field. Why do they pick that location and not in others? Um, so there's a few examples that I wanted to roll through, but I'm cognizant of the clock ticking along here. Uh, this is uh, organic corn and soybeans planted in six row strips in Pennsylvania that we started working with. Um, this is probably approximately 2011 or 12 um, when we had this experience. And uh, this farmer called us, uh, he had just completed his transition to organic farming and uh, he had major problems with corn rootworm and weevils uh, root, root, um, and weevils in his root system. Uh, they were affecting about 20% of the overall stand and he was concerned that it was getting to be too late to replant and that even if he did replant, there might still be a problem and he was uncertain of how to manage the situation. So he wanted our recommendations on how we would approach this from a nutrition management perspective. And I was very clear uh, when we communicated with him that um, we have no prior experience. I have no idea whether this is going to work or not. Uh, we put together a foliar 
application that contained liquid seaweed because that is an immune elicitor and it triggers an immune response similar to a vaccine. Um, we included a chitin bearing crab shell, shrimp shell uh, liquid combination called Sea Shield. And then we included <coughs> um, some of the key enzyme cofactors, particularly uh, magnesium, molybdenum, boron, and cobalt in a foliar application. Of course, to do that organically, we first had to get a SAP analysis that indicated we actually had a deficiency for those trace minerals. We were then able to put on this foliar application and 48 hours after application, the farmer went out to the field and uh, I'm missing a couple of photos there, but um, they were actually able to find dead rootworm larvae in the root system. And where we put on a foliar application of nutrition on the leaf surface, and that triggered the plant's immune system and changed the uh, nitrogen and protein profile to the point where it actually killed the larvae in the root system. And since then, we have repeated this uh, type of experience on a multitude of different insects and many different crops. And um, I, I should mention, you know, the, the comment that I made, the statement that I made at the beginning, it's possible to produce plants that are 100% resistant to all diseases and all insects. That's a, that's a pretty big mouthful. It's a big claim to make, but it's one that we're completely comfortable and confident in making because after 15 years, this is no longer a hypothesis. This is not a theory. We have experienced this in practice on close to 60 crops. I think it's about 55 crops now at this point um, across all of North America. And on th that list of crops, there are well over a dozen times when uh, we have encountered incurable diseases, diseases for which there is no known treatment like bacterial canker on stone fruit or um, citrus greening or gosses wilt on corn or Pierce's disease on grapes or rib blotch, the list kind of goes on and on, crown gall. There is no known treatment. And yet we've been able to reverse the symptoms of those diseases and completely eliminate them with nutrition management and with microbiome management. So uh, I have a lot of confidence after having that experience repeatedly so many times. Um, I certainly haven't encountered or experienced all possible disease and crop combinations, but enough that, that I'm quite confident this is repeatable and replicable anywhere we take it. So here's another example. This was organic corn in Kansas. And uh, let me see, this was in 2015. Crop Scout walked the field and identified a fairly severe infestation of spider mites. And uh, we were actually not aware that the spider mites were there, but two weeks prior or a week prior, the grower had collected a sap analysis sample and we made recommendations for uh, nutri nutrients to be applied in the pivot that was being uh, for on the irrigation system. So um, the pivot was just starting its circle, which would was a 48 hour circle to uh, cross the entire circle at the time the crop scout was there. So the nutrients had already started to be applied and 48 hours after the application was complete, all the spider mites were dead. And <laughs> it's such a powerful experience when that happens. And this crop also had no corn earworm or European corn borer. And they ended up producing 215 bushel in dryland Kansas with irrigation, which is exceptional for organic corn in the area. And of course, it's a lot of fun when your crops are actually healthier than the weeds. And that means the insects begin attacking the weeds instead of the crop. It's a lot of fun when that happens. So um, I'm missing part of the explanation here. I haven't completed part of the explanation. Why is it that we're able to kill insects, some of these insects or some of these pests, simply by changing plant nutrition? Well, we know that the digestive system of different organisms is different. Our digestive system is different from the digestive system of a ruminant animal, like a dairy cow or a goat or a sheep. Because, um, and partic in particular, 
these ruminant animals are able to derive energy from forages, from cellulose, because the organisms in their rumen and in their digestive tract produce the cellulase enzyme, which is capable of breaking down cellulose and they are capable of extracting energy from it and contributing this energy to the livestock. However, we know that we don't get energy from consuming dry hay because our digestive systems lack the cellulase enzyme. So we're not able to utilize as a food source what the dairy cow is able to utilize as a food source. And this is a parallel analogy to the differences between our digestive system and the digestive system of an insect. When we describe these different bonds being built, amino acids being combined together to form different amino acids or uh, form various peptides and then peptides being bonded together to form complete proteins. Many of the insects with relatively simple digestive systems, the larval insects such as um, cabbage looper and tomato hornworm and so forth, lack the digestive enzymes to break the final peptide to peptide bond that gets used to make complete proteins. They can no more digest proteins than we can digest dry hay. And so this produces, uh, this produces a crop and a plant that when you change the plant's protein profile, you change the amino acid profile so that you no longer have soluble nitrogen compounds and you instead have these complete proteins, they're simply incapable of using it as a food source. And I think it'd be at this point that perhaps useful to destroy one of the myths that is common in, in organic agriculture specifically. I don't know how many times I have heard organic farmers say, uh, or try to defend a crop that has insects in it. Uh, maybe you have apples that have worms in them or um, spinach or salad greens that have aphids in them with the comment that, well, if it's good enough for the worms to eat or good enough for the insects to eat, then it's good enough for me to eat. That is dead wrong. It's dead wrong because these plants, when they are at optimal health and optimal for us to eat, they are not capable of being a food source for insects. So um, we don't, there, there's a reason we have this immediate psychological aversion to plants that are being consumed by insects because on a deep instinctive level, we intuitively recognize them as not being fit for human consumption. And of course, mainstream production agriculture is no less guilty of the uh, believed wisdom or intelligence, wisdom is definitely the wrong word, believed smarts to then take these plants that are extremely unhealthy and soak them with poisons and then feed them to people. That doesn't seem like a particularly smart idea on any level. So to get to level two of the plant health pyramid, um, we require plants to have adequate levels of these four elements, magnesium, sulfur, molybdenum, and boron. Um, boron is not directly involved in this protein synthesis process that I described, uh, but the, each of the other three are. And if any one of these elements is low or an inadequate supply, you are highly likely to have um, insects in your crop. We, we should be able to find them and see them. So, <clears throat> When we get to level three of the plant health pyramid, this is the level at which plants have a surplus of energy. And when they have a surplus of energy, they store the surplus in the form of fats and oils, exactly the same way that livestock do. If you give livestock more energy than they require in their, in their feed, they store the surplus as fat. Plants do exactly the same thing. And in order to reach level three, it means that plants need to begin absorbing most of their nutrition in the form of living bacterial cells or microbial metabolites. So this is a whole other conversation about the ways in which plants can absorb nutrients, but I would suggest um, look on my podcast or on my blog for some of the research of Dr. James White or just Google Dr. James White. He's got some awesome uh, videos out there as well. In this process that he terms rhizophagy where he's describing how plants can get the great majority perhaps the entirety of their nutrition from absorbing entire bacterial cells 
from the soil microbiome and that are being contributed by fungi. Um, so this is a really fascinating topic and another wormhole that we don't really have the time to go down. But what happens is when, when plants begin absorbing entire bacterial cells or microbial metabolites, it's the equivalent of them absorbing prefab compounds. So I just described this process of converting nitrogen to complete proteins. And this is a very energy intensive process for a plant. In fact, when a plant consumes most of its nitrogen in the form of nitrate, then it can require as much as 16%, 15 to 16% of its total photosynthetic capacity just to convert nitrate to complete proteins. So this is a tremendous energy drain on the plant. But when plants begin absorbing microbial proteins or amino acids or peptides directly from biology, then they no longer need to go through this energy intensive process. And because they're essentially getting prefabricated proteins from soil biology. And the moment that happens, they now develop a surplus of energy and they begin storing this surplus as lipids and oils. And the, the lipid concentration, all plants will have a minimum baseline level as some in the neighborhood of about one and a half to one and three quarter percent on a dry matter basis, because that is the minimal amount of lipids that are required to form the dual phospholipid cell membranes. However, those from those foundational levels, the lipid levels can increase by as much as three to four X. I've observed um, fat content on a dry matter basis um, as high as 8% from a baseline moving upwards from a baseline level of one and a half percent. Six percent is relatively easy to achieve, uh, depending on which plant we're talking about. And um, so at this, when you have these elevated levels, you can actually see this visually with this glossy waxy sheen on the leaf surface. And when you have this waxy sheen on the leaf surface, these plants now become much more resistant to all the airborne pathogens, both bacterial and fungal pathogens, uh, mildews and blights and rust, bacterial speck, bacterial spot and so forth. Because when these organisms land on the leaf surface, for the great majority, their infection pathway is to release a pectolytic enzyme designed to break down the pectins on the cell membranes on the leaf cuticle. But because you have this layer of waxes and oils, it effectively serves as a shield so that these enzymes never get access to the pectins in the first place. And uh, I see this is misspelled. The slide says peptolytic enzymes, but it should say pectolytic and as in pectins. Um, and as a result, you have an effective barrier against producing an infection. And this is just one mechanism of many. There are many mechanisms uh, that take place at all of these levels. I'm giving a very rapid fire, simplified overview of something that has hours of and hundreds of papers of science behind it. So in order to get to level three, plants must have a vigorous and active microbiome in the rhizosphere. They must get the majority of their nutrition as living microbes and not as simple ions. So as long as you have a crop production environment where you are constantly adding soluble fertilizers, whether that might be if you're constantly adding high levels of manure or compost or uh, commercial fertilizers, phosphorus and hydrogen potassium, you will never get to level three of plant health because that effectively shuts down or eliminates the need for the microbial uh, population in the rhizosphere to achieve that level. So then that brings us to level four. And um, level four is when plants begin producing high levels of these plant secondary metabolites. And <clears throat> so a different way of saying this is to talk about the various plant or describe this is to, is to talk about the various plant immune pathways. So you have the SAR pathway and the ISR pathway. Um, don't think I have the details on what that means in other slides here. So I'll just review it quickly. SAR stands for systemic acquired resistance. And if I recall correctly, that pathway is, is mediated by salicylic acid, which you may recognize as aspirin. And the ISR pathway stands for induced systemic resistance. And that one is mediated by jasmonic acid or ethylene. And the key point though, is that both of these pathways, both of these immune pathways are triggered by biology. 
So when you have this disease suppressive microbiome in the root system that I spoke of, that means you can also have this disease suppressive microbiome on the leaf surface, on the phylosphere and living inside the plant tissue. This is an important piece to recognize is that plants are completely colonized by biology. There is a lot of discussion and emphasis on the biology in the roots, in the root zone, in the rhizosphere, as there should be, but there is a parallel both to inside the plant's vascular tissue and on the plant leaf surface. And so when you have the, the healthy microbial populations colonizing the plant, they will trigger these immune pathways and upregulate the formation of all of these, what we call essential oils. And now we have very aromatic plants. So all of you I'm sure have observed plants, perhaps different varieties or different growing conditions where uh, one tomato plant has an overwhelmingly strong aroma, uh, tomato -y aroma, and another plant has a very weak smell. You can hardly smell it. And those are all degrees of expression of these two pathways uh, triggering the formation of these aromatic compounds. So um, once plants reach this level of plant health, they now become resistant to the entire beetle family of insects, such as Japanese beetles and Colorado potato beetles and cucumber beetles, nematodes and so forth, as well as viruses. And uh, it's really interesting. Uh, we've actually documented uh, planting seed uh, in this case, seed potatoes are the, are the case that I have in my mind. Uh, planting seed potatoes with known, measured, tested levels of virus present in the seed potatoes and harvested a daughter crop of seed potatoes with no detectable virus levels present. Did we remove the virus um, over that generation? Perhaps, but for sure, uh, I've also observed that in a single generation on a current crop, if you plant seeds with known viral um, contamination, it's possible to shut down the expression of that viral DNA based on nutritional integrity. And by the way, this is not new information. I discovered this in some research that was done back in the early 1900s, uh, where they discovered that supplementation with high levels of molybdenum and selenium and other high uh, atomic weight trace minerals would shut down viral DNA expression. So again, the key is microbiology on the leaf surface and in the root system to achieve that level. So when you look at this, you notice there's a distinct gap in the middle of the plant health pyramid. The bottom two levels are based on passive immunity. You simply remove the food source. You change the food source. You no longer have digestible forms of nitrogen and uh, incomplete sugars. And they are purely based on balancing plant nutrition and chemistry. You can do this in a hydroponic environment, very simple and very straightforward. And you can turn, uh, you can often turn crops around with a single foliar application as, as I described in the two corn examples. And by the way, corn is, uh, I, I like using the two corn examples because corn is one of the less responsive crops to foliar applications you get a much bigger response from most vegetable and most fruit crops than you will from corn. Corn is a very, uh, it's a, a very rigid plant, if you will, it has a set pathway and it's going down that pathway. Many other crops are very highly responsive compared to corn. And so when you think about the effects being produced in that corn crop, that is possible to an even greater effect in a fruit and vegetable crop. A single foliar application can reverse an insect infestation in a matter of 24 to 48 hours. We've experienced that hundreds of times. The upper two levels of the plant health pyramid are where the plant switches from passive immunity to active immunity. And to get there requires that we have abundant and happy and vigorous biology in that plant microbiome, in the rhizosphere and on the leaf surface and inside the plant's vascular tissue. So uh, I spoke a bit about the two immune pathways, not going to elaborate on that. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, the, I do want to speak briefly to um, the concentrations of plant secondary metabolites. Well, actually, I'm not sure that this is so important though, but um, <clears throat> there is this idea sometimes that if you want to produce plants with that have are very aromatic, 
or maybe saying it a different way that have high concentrations of essential oils. If you're growing mint, for example, or cannabis or um, any fruit where you want high levels of flavor and aroma, the historical strategy has been to manage this crop with either water deprivation or nutrient deprivation, nitrogen, phosphorus uh, are two common ones to reduce the overall plant biomass and create stress. And that stress would then increase the concentrations of plant secondary metabolites. Um, this slide is wrong. And what is wrong is that the two graphs are mislabeled. The yellow line should be labeled plant secondary metabolites and the uh, blue line or gray line, whatever color it is, should be titled plant biomass. So the labels are flipped from what they should be. Um, so what happens is as you, uh, as you create plant stress, then the levels of plant secondary metabolites increases, but the plant biomass drops. But then there is this other level on the back end of this uh, graph, which is instead of creating plant stress, you create an optimal environment. You remove as much stress. You create an optimal environment and optimal nutrition. And now you produce really healthy plants at the top of the plant health pyramid. And you will actually get higher plant secondary metabolite levels than you will from a plant stress crop. And anyone who doesn't believe that that is the case should try to persuade a cannabis grower to stress their plants and see how productive that conversation is. Um, one last thought, which is that as you produce these really healthy plants with high levels, this is, this is a self-perpetuating system. It's a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, as you produce plants with these really high concentrations of plant secondary metabolites, they will also transmit those essential oils down through the root system to feed soil biology, and that will change the soil microbiome. And that will produce a disease suppressive soil microbiome. So the fastest way to change soil biology is to grow really healthy plants with high levels of photosynthesis. So that concludes my presentation. I went a bit over the time that I had anticipated, but uh, we're going to open it up for any questions that you might have on any of these topics. So we have quite a few questions. Um, uh, we have a couple wows, <laughs> I love that. Um, and then a lot of sort of very detailed specifics. Um, I think, you know, let's start, there was one question, um, just very baseline. Can you talk about nutrient management versus foliar feeding? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of detail to answer that question well, and I would refer you to two webinars that we did that are on our YouTube channel. One of them is, uh, is titled um, Designing Foliar Applications, because not all foliar applications are effective because they're not designed properly in terms of tank mix and so forth. And so we go into some detail about how to produce or how to design an effective foliar application. And then there's a, a, separate, a second webinar on... Um, how we use soil analysis to make recommendations for soil amendments. So <clears throat> from a really big picture perspective, our intent, our long-term goal is to get a farm ecosystem to the point where we are not dependent on foliar applications as an active management tool. We want to develop soil biology and soil health to such a state that they are self-sustaining and that they don't require outside inputs. Um, so that's the intention and the goal. And the question is, what's the shortest and fastest way to get there? I describe that as by increasing photosynthesis. We use foliar sprays as one of the tools to do that or to accelerate that. But then when you think about um, soil amendments, um, at this moment, uh, we, we use a lot of soil amendments and we use soil analysis, but there are a couple of nutrients, which in our opinion can seldom be properly addressed on compromised soil with compromised biology as a soil amendment in the short term. Um, and those two are particularly iron and manganese. And there's a long explanation of why this is, but what you will find is that most soil analysis and even most dry matter-based tissue analysis will report abundant levels of iron and manganese. And yet when you do a, or particularly of iron, often tissue analysis will show low levels of manganese, but then um, when you do a plant sap analysis, we 
consistently find iron and manganese to be extremely low. And we are finding that the iron and manganese that is present in the system is not physiologically active in the plant because it's in the wrong form. And again, this is a wormhole that uh, I want to make sure we have as much time for questions, for various questions as possible. But let's say it this way, all these different trace mineral elements exist in the soil in different oxidation states. Some that we term reduced, some that we term oxidized. If we think of iron as an example, if you take a piece of uh, steel or iron and you expose it to the elements, it starts rusting. That rust is oxidized iron. The majority of iron in our soil is present in the form of oxidized iron. It shows up on soil tests as being really high. The majority of manganese in our soils is present in the oxidized form of manganese. It shows up on our soil test as being really high, but here's the problem. Plants can't use it. They cannot use rust. They can't utilize oxidized iron and manganese. They can absorb it. It can move up into the plant, but it's not physiologically active. They never utilize it which is why they just keep absorbing more and more and more. And you run tissue analysis results and you show these really high levels of iron. And yet the crop is actually physiologically iron deficient. And it's very easy to demonstrate this. Just take a foliar application and do a, a test spray application with iron and watch the plants turn dark green overnight. It's phenomenal to observe this tremendous crop response. So um, there's, a long explanation for why iron and manganese are primarily oxidized. Let's just say in summary that it is a result of our historical soil mismanagement with lots of tillage and fertilizer applications that all have an oxidizing effect. And the pathway to reversing that, it is the function of biology to convert these oxidized trace mineral metals back into the reduced form that plants can utilize. That's where we want to get several years down the road is where we have such abundant biology that they can reduce these trace minerals and make them available to plants. But that is difficult in the short term or the first year to two years. And in that time period is when there is really no alternative, in my opinion, for foliar applications to address those minerals and make sure that plants really spike photosynthesis to 60%. Okay, I recognize we are just over time. I do have a couple more questions for you. For anyone that's interested in joining sure. the uh, movement break that is going to start, we have a little yoga movement session, stretch session at uh, two forty. So hop on over to that if that's on your agenda for today. Um, but just to take a couple more minutes with you, um, with so many farmers on the call, you know there are some questions about what kind of tools are available for farmers to use in the field. To, to do this assessment and or, right, how, how can farmers better interpret the soil tests to know if they have enough, uh, you know, of these areas that you're talking about? What, what soil tests do you recommend? You know, this, let's get into the details of how do we, how do we know? How do we know the numbers here? For every question you ask, I can give I you I know, it's question. ours. It's ours. I can give you an answer already. The answer is, there's a webinar on that. The Advancing Eco Agriculture YouTube channel, we have um, over 110 videos that are roughly an hour long where we take each one of these topics one question at a time and we do a deep dive as I've just done describing the details. So um, I, it's become kind of cliche for me to say there's a webinar. There's on a that, webinar that's for that. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we can drop the, uh, the Oak team can drop the YouTube channel link into the, the <laughs> chat there for everyone um, and we can, we can add it to your... Um, profile in the Whova app as well. So people can, can be linked yeah. up with that. Great. Um, well, wonderful questions all around. Um, Jenny's dropped the, the links in there to the YouTube channel. Thanks for that. Um, John, I just, we could, we could do, we could do this all day, um, multiple days and we're just yeah, so great. Yes. Yes. Go. If you have, there are many questions, many great questions, more than we have time for today, obviously. Um, and one of my reasons for developing the Kind Harvest platform was to have a platform to facilitate this type of deep and thoughtful exchange. So if you have these types of questions, please join us on kindharvest.ag. There are thousands of farmers on this regenerative pathway who are sharing and exchanging information and debating these ideas and asking questions. There's discussion forums, there's groups. It's, a, it's an incredible environment, unlike anything you'll find elsewhere on social media, because one of the first rules of engagement is be kind and everything is moderated. So we would really love to have you there. Ah, oh, wonderful. John, we're just, we're so grateful for your time and your curiosity um, through all of 
your learnings um, and what you share with everyone. So if y'all liked what you heard today and you want more time with John, join us in Hopkinsville, March 17th and 18th. John is on the agenda all morning on March 18th out in Hopkinsville and all the information on his sessions um, and the keynote out there are on our website. You can register now. So um, take care all, John. So much gratitude. Thank you. Um, we look forward to seeing you again pretty soon. Thanks, everyone. Uh,